This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. From MPB Think Radio, this is Southern Remedy. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi. Glad to be with you on this hot, muggy Wednesday morning. Just makes you sleepy, doesn't it? Particularly if you didn't get enough sleep last night like me. But we are welcoming you to the program today. That's right. This is your chance to call in and get answers to the health care questions that you have. It's a great way to ask questions about that new medication, or maybe it's a side effect of something that you're dealing with, or maybe it's some new um, problems that you've been diagnosed with that you just don't don't quite know what that means or what the impact of that is, you can call us right now with those questions and more by dialing one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Certainly, we know a lot of people aren't going to be able to call in right now, but uh, we would love to hear from you by email. So you can send those emails to remedy at mpbonline.org. Let's go to our first caller, Sally in Columbus. Good morning, Sally. Good morning. I had a question about bioidentical hormones and your thoughts about those and whether there are any issues with those and like with hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. Are you talking about sort of like the phytoestrogens or the soy-based estrogens and those kinds of things? I guess it's referred to as like pellets that are um, injected under the skin. Oh, okay. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so so you have to, you know, the hormones that the body produces naturally, uh, they have all these different ebbs and flows. There's very few hormones that, that stay at the same level, and there's feedback mechanisms for that. And in different po- uh, points in our lives, depending on, you know, where we are age-wise and what else is going on, if you're pregnant, if you're not pregnant, all those hormones change with time, and they have an impact on how we feel, on some of the metabolic processes that our body does, and, the, you know, some of that we know a lot about, and some of it we don't know a whole lot about. So some of the concerns with hormone replacement therapy, particularly in women with estrogens and estrogen derivatives, uh, there can be some negative side effects with that. One of the biggest ones is uh, it's it's small, but it is a risk of having a blood clot, basically, that forms in your veins if you're taking, uh, you know, estrogen replacement. And it's it, even if you use the same levels that our body uses earlier in life, there seems to continue to be that risk. Now, a lot of people feel great. They have positive changes in their skin and in all kinds of different areas. So it does have some beneficial effects but you always have to weigh those against the risk the the what you know what a lot of people are calling the biological estrogens or the non you know non formulated estrogens those can come from a number of different sources the most common sources are plant based estrogens so uh, not only do uh, mammals and other animals make estrogens and other hormones like that some plants do that too and they're similar they're not totally the same, but they don't seem to have a lot of the negative side effects. So things that are derived from uh, soybeans uh, is, a, is one. There's others that are out there, and they can be delivered to the body in different means. So one of them is orally. That's probably the most common way to do that, is to take that orally in a pill form. Uh, some of it is transdermal, which is basically a patch that you absorb through the skin. And then some of it is sort of a slow release, like you, uh, you know, just described with having it uh, implanted in a device that slowly leaks that out. Um, I, of, of all of them, and again, they're all a little bit different, um, so you really have to look at the research that's been done. If they don't have a good research, and I'm not talking about five people tried this and they felt better and didn't have any problems. I'm talking about hundreds of people in a reputable way, uh, usually a randomized controlled trial where they uh, enlist people. It's double-blinded, meaning you don't know who's getting the, the intervention, who's not getting the intervention. 
and and really look at some of the long term side effects of it. If they don't have that data, I would be very skeptical, particularly of the ones that are implantable, because some of those bypass the normal mechanisms uh, that our bodies break down those hormones and uh, absorb them, and it can, in some instances, cause some liver damage in those in those cases. So, I'd be a little bit wary of it if it's plant based. You know, I tell people. Try a bunch of soybeans or try some of the soy-based things. Um, uh, black cohash is another one that a lot of people are – it's not anything you smoke, but that's something that's a – something that you ingest, and that's totally – you know, totally safe to take. But I would be a little bit hesitant about the implantable ones. And without knowing exactly which one that is, I'd have to go and do some research on it, even even if you gave me the name. But I, I would maybe, you know, let your let your physician or, or GYN look at that and say, hey, is this going to cause me any kind of harm? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. And I wish we could give out prizes for the first person to call really quick. Sally was on the ball this morning. The number to call if you have a question about anything, doesn't have to be what somebody else was asking about, is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Let's go to David in Horn Lake. Good morning, David. Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. i got two questions that are totally unrelated. One of them is late night on uh a religious station, they're advertising stem cell activators, 27 different stem cell activators, and they got a little marquee footable across the bottom of the screen claiming these 27 different uh, stem cell activators will help or potentially cure just about every disease on Earth. I was wondering if there's any truth to it or or if there's been any any double-blind placebo studies on it or if it's just snake oil. Yeah, is that the first question? Yeah, that's the first let me, question. Let me take it. So snake oil, that's what I can say about that. So, you know, the, a lot of I've seen these commercials saying, hey, these are things that stimulate the natural stem cells that your body has. And stem cells are something that we call pluri potent cells, meaning they have the ability to become just about anything in your body. They have the ability to become bone, to become blood cells, to become muscle, to become skin. And under the right conditions in signaling, which is an internal process that is derived from the cells around it and where these cells go, that can in turn, they can have basically brand new cells. Now, they come from wherever you get them. Now, we used to do these stem cell transplants, where, and we still do some uh, that come from somebody else. They can also take stem cells from individual people, and then they're sort of, uh, you know, grow those under certain media and then inject those back. But as far as anything that can induce those to do something, the only induction that really works is the one that's in the body itself. So once you inject those back in the body in certain situations, if you inject them in the bone marrow, they can become, uh, you know, the, a new set of uh, cells that produce the components of the blood, including white cells and red cells and platelets. But if you don't, there's not really anything you can treat them with. That would be great, actually, if we could do that. There is some research being done on that to tease it out, because we'd love to grow some new organs like kidneys and hearts made out of the same genetic material and programming that the person's own tissues were. That way we wouldn't have to worry about rejection. That is way in the future. Uh, There is some research going on about that. But as far as anything you can just take, and as far as curing every disease, that's really a misrepresentation of what stem cells actually do. Stem cells are those early, early cells that can become anything, as we mentioned, and um, it's really, they're going to become tissues. They're not going to cure a disease necessarily uh, in, you know, like diabetes or that kind of thing. Now, you could, you know, take out somebody's pancreas or you could grow a pancreas potentially down the road and put that in somebody, but we really don't have that, that technology now and certainly don't have anything we can say, hey, take this, it'll induce all the stem cells in your body to do different things and cure you of all kinds of stuff. So, I'm going to call snake oil on that one, although the research Search in the future is going to be really, I think, exciting to see what, what we come up with with stem cells. Second question. Second question is, um, I'm, I'm, I live, I'm a widower. I live by myself, and I'm 60, working on 67. And uh, I'm noticing my short-term memory is getting really, really, really bad. I mean, I spend more time looking for my coffee cup, car keys, and I'll set them down, and five minutes later, I don't know what the heck I did with them. My question to you is, how do you know when your when your memory is just part of natural aging, whether or not it's a wake up warning signs of dementia? 
My mother had Alzheimer's, my daddy had Parkinson's, and my sister had multiple sclerosis, and I'm afraid that I'll probably have a predeposition for neurological diseases. Is there such thing as an Alzheimer's test? There's there's one in development right now that again is not prime time, but they're looking at it that looks at at the so you you get end up having these protein deposits in the brain called plaques, neurofibrillary tangles or plaques, and that's sort of the hallmark of of Alzheimer's. And they've they're they're looking at a specific test, particularly in families that have a higher risk of it, to see if you have that. Now, to be honest, the things you would do to try to prevent it are is the same whether you would be at risk for it or not. There's also a, uh, and, and I'll talk about those in just a second. There's also a medication that's being developed to block the development of that. So if you do have if they do, you know, if you're diagnosed with early Alzheimer's at that point, you could you could have this treatment. It actually looks pretty promising. This is one that's just recently been uh, released by the FDA, and I am blanking on the name of it right now. Uh, I'll try to look it up in the next break and then uh, uh, let everybody know about that. Um, now, how how do we diagnose that? Well. First of all, just because you have dementia doesn't mean you have Alzheimer's, and um, it, it is a very common cause of dementia, but there's other things that can cause that. Making sure that you have a healthy diet, that you have regular sleep habits, and that you're active, all those things can help prevent the progression of dementia, even if you have early signs of it. Using your brain in different ways, you know, a lot of people retire and they just don't do much of anything. You need to think of your brain, even though it's not a muscle, it's a it's neur- neurons or, or nervous tissue, but it really functions the same way. If you don't use it a whole lot, it's not, you're going to be pretty poor on some of those recall things. And then you can get formal testing. So they are geriatricians. So these are people that see older people or people who have problems like dementia, um, and they basically can do a series of tests. I know at, at UMMC we have a, a center called the MIND Center, M-I-N-D, that does this, and I've sent some of my patients there to get some formal testing. Depending on what they see, they may want to do some further tests, and they may want to do some blood tests because there are some things like hypothyroidism or low-functioning thyroid gland that can impact your thinking. So you do need to make sure all those things are being looked at. But if it's just, you know, sort of the normal aging, I forgot my keys, I can't remember that guy's name, and it, but it comes back to me in five minutes or I finally find my keys, that's sort of a normal process. It's just when it progresses beyond that. But I would go see somebody just to give you a once-over if you haven't already. And if you need to see somebody that can do that type of testing, and I'm not talking about like the quick five-minute test they can do in the office. That's a nice screen. And if you do okay on that, they may not need to move further. But there is some some pretty complex testing that they can do it'll take several hours actually to go through it but it can give you a lot of good information about sort of the areas of thinking and cognition that you might be deficient in and if they need to to go any further with looking for things like alzheimer's one more comment real quick um since i have a family history of uh, uh brain neurological disease and whatnot how would you go about donating your brain to science maybe they could use it for experimentation or finding maybe a cure for some of this stuff yeah different ways you can do that i would contact somewhere like ummc or another academic uh medical center and tell them that you're interested in doing that there's different ways that you can do it but it's a a organ donor program so um, and you can say, hey, if you want, you know, just to uh, look at everything that's, uh, you know, that I've gone through and everything when after I die and use it to the best of, you know, how you want to do that. Or you can specifically say, I want it to go for this purpose. They'll be able to give you a, um, a listing of those kinds of things. And, David, if you're able to listen, I'll um, not only will I try to get the name of that uh, Alzheimer's medication to you, but I'll also give you that number for UMMC to contact. I'll be listening. Thank you. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical questions answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. 
Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to Southern Remedy. I'm Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your calls and questions about all kinds of good health care issues that you might be going through right now. The number to call is 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-7464. Had a great call from uh, David, I believe it was, at Horn Lake, and uh, had some really good questions. One of those was about Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And so if there was anything that you could maybe treat for that, we mentioned one medication that I totally blanked out. Maybe I need some uh, uh, evaluation, but it's called Aduhelm, A D U. H-E-L-M. So that's a new medication for the treatment of Alzheimer's, not really for the prevention yet, but for the treatment of it, if you do have it. The second question was, if you wanted to donate your body to science for, you know, scientific um, uh, educational type purposes, um, uh, certainly contacting any academic medical center that's closest to you is probably the best bet. But I do have the one at uh, University Medical Center in Jackson. So the email for that is body donation, all one word up together at umc.edu or the phone number for that is 601-984-1649. I should mention too the NIH, National Institute of Health, also has uh, some on their main website. If you go and look and sort of search for that, you might see some further information about how you might go about doing that. All right, we're going to go to Sue from Beaumont. Good morning, Sue. Good to talk to you this morning. How are you? Good morning. <clears throat> I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to, to thank that guy who is going to donate his brain. I think that's so altruistic and wonderful to do that, don't you? <laughs> Absolutely. I, you know, and, and part of my training depended upon uh, the gracious donation of individuals and their families of their bodies for, for science. And, you know, a lot of people will have problems with that and say, you know, in, in that sort of uh sort of weird or creepy and I, I can tell you my experience is there it's it was with great reverence and appreciation that we you know when we were going through gross anatomy and we were going through uh, neuroanatomy uh, that helps out a lot. It's just there's no substitute for that. We certainly have lots of computer programs that can simulate that and lots of different scans and things, but it's it really helps out, particularly in those specialties that, uh, you know, surgeons, neurosurgeons, that's, that's, that's really integral to what they do. So I agree with you, Sue. I want to ask you a question right quick, okay? Sure. My, I have a daughter, excuse me, in Texas, and she called and in, in, uh, she was in the hospital for a, a renal failure and that's all I knew renal failure and then some doctor whose accent I couldn't understand came on the phone and said that uh, some kind of antibiotics do you know what kind of antibiotics it could be some kind of antibiotics that she had been taking caused her uh, just sudden renal failure have you ever heard of that? What kind of antibiotic is that? I've yeah. never heard of that. You can actually there's many medications that can actually do that it's rare and there's different there's either direct injury to the kidney or there is an allergic type response to that medication. So you can have something called acute interstitial nephritis um, that can be caused by medications, including antibiotics. But there's also some toxic um, uh, effects of some antibiotics, particularly if the levels get too high. One that uh, a common one is vancomycin. So vancomycin is something that you have to take through an IV. You can actually take it orally for something, but that really, really doesn't cause um, kidney damage. But basically, at higher levels, it can be toxic to the kidney. Genomycin is another one. There's there are lots of different medications. Um, that you have to adjust depending on the level of kidney function you already have. So that's always, you know, for some things we'll get lab tests beforehand before we'll prescribe them just to make sure. But uh, it could be, Sue, it could be about 10 to 15 different antibiotics, honestly. Well, I didn't know that. Is there any way to reverse that? They've got it on dialysis now. Yeah, sometimes it is. It depends upon the type of damage that's done. And um, sometimes you just sort of have to wait and see. And sometimes I've seen some patients that went on dialysis and then they were able to come off of it after their kidneys recovered. But you want to make sure that you've got optimal conditions for them to recover, you know, and not have anything else that's sort of impacting that. Well, thank you. 
Thank you, Sue, and uh, good luck to your. Did you say it's your daughter in Texas? Uh-huh. Okay, okay. Thank yeah. you. Yes, ma'am. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call is one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We're going to go to Tom and Brandon. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Doctor Jimmy. How are you? Good. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, several months ago, I'd say about three months ago, uh, playing golf. Uh, about halfway through the round, I found myself in what they call the rough, which is high grass. I've been there many and, times. <laughs> me too. <laughs> and uh, I swung a little harder out of that, and something happened to my hip. Uh, it didn't pop or anything, but it did hurt, and I could not walk straight. I had to limp uh, and thought I was going to have to quit the round. Uh, and as I, I continued on, I limped for a few holes, and then it got a little better, and I was able to finish but I, my question is, could that have been a dislocation? Uh, it's several months later now. I don't have any problems when I play golf. I don't feel it at all. But I walk in the mornings uh, at a quick, pretty quick pace, and I do feel it. It's not like a sharp pain, but there is a nagging sort of pain that uh, is associated with it. Could I have dislocated that? And if I did, will it just be able to go, go back together? without a problem yeah there's there's a lot of different things that is a so that that hip socket is a ball and joint socket so it's a very tight socket if you think about it in comparison to our shoulder shoulder's not that i mean it's like a modified ball and joint but it's not really a ball and joint um, because it has more mobility so although the hip does give us mobility it's sort of locked in there so it's locked in there by tendons uh, and ligaments and those depending on if you you know, like you said, in a motion where you're you're you know basically hitting out of the rough and probably just hit a little bit too fat and just sort of stuck through there, or it was a lot more pressure, those things can tear, and certainly they can cause a lot of problems immediately. If it's a tendon um, or a ligament, um, sometimes if it's a partial tear of it, they can can heal up pretty good. Now. Several different things can happen to make that joint dislocate, but it is it takes a lot to get it to dislocate unless you already have damage to it. So um, I, it would be very unlikely for it to be dislocated out of socket and then immediately come back in just because, that's again, it's a tight joint. A shoulder can pop in and out all the time, and it's most of the time it's pretty easy to get that back in. Um, depending on the, the laxity, the person's laxity of those tendons and, and, uh, and uh, ligaments. But it's less likely, particularly with that, that motion, that you could have done that. Now, you could have torn like the labrum, so that's like the cartilage that, um, that lines the, the bone uh, between the femur. That's the, the upper leg bone and the pelvis that, where it's in that joint space. Um, those don't heal up as well, and they usually are there for a while. So if you're feeling it later on, you may have a small tear there, or you might have a couple of things that happened all at once. I suspect it's probably just a tendon that was partially torn or a ligament. And those sideways movements, particularly as we get older, if you're not doing those, you know, and, and hitting out of the rough, I get it. The worst thing is, like, if a heavy rain and you hit something sort of fat, and I've done the same thing, and everything just stops. And um, that causes a lot of tearing to those and a lot of pressure on those joints. But if it's okay while you're walking and you're still playing golf without any problem, if it's just a little bit sore, I probably wouldn't, you know, I probably wouldn't think anything was wrong with it. Best way to look at that, x-rays help some, but they only tell us about the bony parts of the joint. But an MRI would would really show us um, the ligaments and tendons and all those cartilage surfaces. Most of the time we can't just jump to the MRI just because it's expensive and there may be other things that we can do first. But um, that's that's if it continues or if it gets worse, that's certainly something I would do uh, to get it checked out. But uh, my last question to you, Tom, is did you make the shot? Uh, I missed the putt. (laughs) (laughs) There we go. (laughs) Uh, The the second quick question is is I've I've heard – many times uh, about athletes, particularly football players, that have hip pointers. Can you explain quickly what a hip pointer is? Because I've never really heard what that is. Yeah, so, you know, any kind of sport that has um, 
a potential for overuse injuries or um, if you're exposing yourself to a lot of force like football players. I mean, football players have gotten so big these days. It's it's really, you know, it's it's really impressive the amount of force that they can generate. So a hip pointer is basically one of those injuries. It's a it's really like a deep bruise, and it's on the ridge of the bone on the on the upper outer portion of your hip. So it's called the iliac crest. And it's really just a, a bruise over that area. You know, we like to give things, you know, uh, catchy terms like that so but that's basically what it is and um it it usually after you know getting off that a little bit and allowing it to heal up it does okay but if you're a lineman and you're you know getting hit over and over again you want to stay in the game you can see how that would uh that would sort of uh, throw a wrench into things but usually you have to uh, something that's like a deep bruise on the bone itself that's going to require you to uh halt that activity for a while but that's basically what it is Okay, and one last quick thing related to what you were discussing earlier. Uh, is there an age limit for donation of organs or body? No, I don't think that they do have one. That that may have changed. Uh, I don't know the specifics, but I, I'm pretty sure that they don't have an age limit on that. That, um, yeah, we, you know, back th- uh, to almost uh, 30 years ago, we had, um, you know, everybody from early 20s, to up into their 90s um, that donated their bodies. And that's you sort of need that, too. You need that that uh, variation across the age ranges to see how things are different. Okay. Well, I appreciate your help and uh, at least the comfort of uh, knowing that perhaps my hip isn't uh, damaged. <laughs> right, right. If it, if it continues, I'd get it looked at. But I, I think it sounds like it's probably healed up a little bit. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical questions answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing a doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning. Uh, lots of good calls about all kinds of different things. Well, I like to hear on the program. Sometimes it's good to hear multiple topics or, or one topic with multiple callers, but uh, I like the variety. Maybe it's just the medpeds in me. Let's go to Janice in Hattiesburg. Good morning, Janice. Good morning. Thank you for calling. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, was stung by a wasp last Thursday, and it was just under my eye, and of course my whole side of my head, face swelled up, even though I'm already on Benadryl and Zyrtec every day, and it's pretty much all gone down except for a um, pea-sized lump right there in the corner of my eye, and I don't know, how can I get rid of that lump? Two two possibilities of what this might be. So with any kind of swelling that you get like that, it can affect, and I'm guessing this is close to your lower eyelid. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, there are a couple of glands um, that help to lubricate your eyelashes and the internal, um, that, that thin layer of tears. They're, they're really the ones that produce that. And mm-hmm. sometimes if you have either an infection or you have an allergic reaction or just any kind of, of even trauma to the face, it swells up like that. It can affect how those glands drain into the eye. So it mm-hmm. might be it might be a sty that's there. Or the other thing would be, is it where the wasp stung you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. If it's right where it stung you, um, then it could just be a residual of some of the stuff that they stung you with, because that can sometimes 
take a couple of weeks to go down. And and the way the body attacks that, it sends a lot of cells in there, and they can have some scar tissue. But if it if it's pea sized particularly later in this week, I think I'd get it looked at because you may have a piece of something still in there, like a piece of the stinger. <laughs> um, I mean, that's a that's a possibility if it, even if it's small. Um, uh-huh. But having somebody, and I would probably go to a dermatologist to look at that, or uh-huh. uh, maybe even a plastic surgeon just to look at it, just to see what they thought, uh, just because of where it is, and if they do have to, you know, sort of dig that little booger out, um, that's that's some somebody who's skilled in that area is not going to leave a big scar. But I, that's the two possibilities. If it's if it's where it stung you, though, I think it's probably the latter. That it's probably it may be just either a piece of, of farm material that's still in there, or it's just the process that the body was sort of fighting that off um, after being stung. Not really anything you can do at home after that. I mean, at this point, you know, it's not really an allergic reaction. You might want to try like a warm compress. I know that's sort of old school, but sometimes that helps sort of mobilize those tissues and those scar tissue that's in that in that uh, place. Okay, so wait. I'd wait, wait till the, the end of the week. week. Yeah, I'd yeah. wait till the end of the end of this week. First next week. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you for calling. We appreciate it. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call is one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Yeah, I thought that was going to be a question about putting a steak on it or putting some kind of tobacco, you know, or paste or something like that. Which I have had all of that uh, in the many years that I've had stings, but um, most of those don't do too much. Besides, they they feel good if it's cool <laughs> on the face to sort of neutralize all those nasty things that that the hymenoptera that's the the uh, generic uh, the gen, genera of all those stinging insects that they can uh, they can uh, sting you with let's go to Nancy from Brandon good morning Nancy good morning um, I would I have a question about a, a, I had a colon resection um, because uh, I I had um, well, I had a colon resection because of a pelvic lift. Uh-huh. I had it, and and the pelvic lift was done after or before. No, it was after the um, pelvic lift, and within three days. Of having that surgery, that cold day, I was told that he uh, that I, about a foot and a half of bowel was removed and reattached uh, to that part of uh, to my uh, rectum, which goes down through my anus. Right. Well, since. I well within three days um, I had um, I was hurting you know I was given some steroid um, oh dear what are they some steroid uh, like a medication steroid medication steroid medication to to put inside my rectum for 12 days. And that was supposed to shrink it, you know, that part of the uh, bowel that kept falling down through the uh, my anus. Uh, I had lots and lots of diarrhea, but finally got, got that under control. Is there a surgeon or... Uh, some way is there a surgery that can correct that and i'm just uh-huh yeah there, there actually is and uh so rectal prolapse which it sounds like that's what you're having can be a yeah. complication yeah. after a surgery like that and actually you can have it just without having any kind of surgery uh so i've had some patients that have had this and 
It's more of a nuisance than anything else. It does cause a lot of irritation and problems. I, you know, I've had several patients that had it for years, and they were just like, you know, I just when I use the bathroom, it happens every time. I just take the toilet paper and sort of push it back up in there, and it's fine. Um, but if it does cause some problems and it's very irritating to you, there are there are ways to sort of tack that back down to the tissue. So basically. It's it's sort of hard. It's a hard thing to explain to people. Basically, that that tissue that you had taken out and now is, you know, when you bear down to have a bowel movement or anything like that, it's the pressure sort of telescopes that that portion of your large intestine outside the body through the anus. Um, and the surgeries, they can do it a couple of ways. They can do it the old-fashioned way, which is a little bit is open, or they can do it laparoscopically with small incisions. And you just the biggest thing is those are general surgeons or they're going to be uh, uro, uro, uh, urogenital surgeons. Um, you just want somebody who's done this well um, to ask them. If it's just a general surgeon that's, that's doing everything, if they don't have a lot of experience in this area, I would probably ask them, who they would, if they had a family member of themselves, who would they ask to do it um, and and get a second opinion on that? And then ask specific questions about what's the success, success rate of this surgeon in doing this procedure? What uh, are the complications, um, you know, both from having any kind of surgery in this particular surgery, and what are the risks involved with it? So if you ask those three questions, they should be able to talk to you about that. If they're reluctant to talk to you about that, go get another surgeon um, because that's that's really important that you can trust them with that. And you need to know what the outcomes are. Um, but it is, you know, in my patients that went and had it repaired, they really haven't had many problems um, with it. So I am unaware of, uh, you know, anybody in the Brandon area, but I do know we have a few surgeons that have done this at UMMC and they do a great job with it. So if you, you know, just call and ask for the, um, you know, for the surgery department line, they can they can assist you with that or talk to your physician about that. But uh, yeah, it, it can be successful and Frequently, it does happen after a surgery like that. So any kind of like bladder lift or uh, uterine surgery, hysterectomy, it just changes the anatomy of the interior of the pelvis, and it can cause problems like this to come up. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical questions answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning. Have some great questions so far. Plenty of time to uh, squeeze in one or two more questions. If you have a hankering for knowledge about any kind of healthcare issue that you might have, the number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. 672 you know, we should mention, too, it, a lot of people are like, you know, I don't really have the time with my job. Well, I want to listen to the show, but I don't really have that time or I may have missed something. You can always go back on our website, MPB Online. 
org and search for Southern Remedy. We do archive those. Or if you'd like to subscribe to uh, Southern Remedy on any of your favorite podcasting apps, you can do that. Just search for Southern Remedy uh, under uh, Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Uh, previous caller did talk about sort of a wasp wasp sing. I did. I think I, I missed did I, So I am a long way from my biology degree. Uh, but the Hymenoptera is the order, not the genera. So the that includes bees, wasp, and ants, and they're all a little bit different. Uh, most people don't realize this so here in the South. Uh, in fact, I was, I, we had met a potential uh, basketball candidate uh, student uh, that was visiting uh, Mississippi College, and they were from a different part of the country, and they were like, you know. Uh, we were uh, saw them out at by the reservoir, and they had um, uh, some al- little baby alligators out there, and they were saying, "Do these get big?" I was like, "Oh yeah, they get real big. Uh, they get twelve, fourteen feet long, sometimes longer than that." And the parents' eyes got big, and they're like, "I don't know about this." I was like, "I'm not helping recruitment right now," but we worry about things like that. We worry about snakes. Certainly, we have our venomous snakes uh, in Mississippi. But most people don't realize that more people die in the United States of uh, wasp, bees, or ant uh, hypersensitivity reactions than anything else, any other envenomation. So if we think about those snakes, um, less people die of that uh, than uh, they do with bees and wasp. And adults can have, uh, typically we think of children having allergic reactions, but adults actually have more severe allergic reactions to those just because you've had, um, you know, a previous venomation from one of those stinging insects, you, you, it doesn't necessarily mean the next time that you're not going to have one. So you need to be, be careful about that. Certainly anything that's local, local meaning wherever you get stung, if it should swell up a little bit, just as the way that venomation works, the way the venom works, and the way your body tries to ward that off, try to contain it. Um, but uh, the ones that cause more systemic reactions, in other words, if it stings you on your hand, but now your whole arm is swollen, or if you have trouble breathing or swallowing, that's the point to really get to a professional. You, go, you need to go straight to the ER, and you don't need to try to tough those things out. That's how people die of those. But you want to be careful, and if you do have one of those, you need to see an allergist about um, you know, getting an EpiPen to have with you, knowing how to use that correctly, and uh, talking about uh, some of the other things that you need to do to avoid those negative reactions. Let's go to Ben all the way down in Gulfport. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Uh, I have a question. I was uh, diagnosed with an uh, enlarged prostate. Yeah. And was and was uh, given Flomax. Uh-huh. And it didn't seem to be working that great. Is there any other medication that they could use? Yeah, there's there's several. So um, that's a common thing. Ben, how old are you? Do you mind me asking? 72. 72. Okay. Young 72. Okay. So uh, basically, you know, as we get older, uh, at least men, that prostate gland can enlarge and it can sometimes cause some uh, some symptoms of decreased urination or, or a decreased stream, uh, forceful stream, and sometimes it can even have overflow incontinence with it. So there's several different ways to to shrink that prostate down. All of the medications take a while to work, and I'm not talking about like a week. Sometimes it can take months to work. So that's one thing to keep in mind that not always, you know, when I put people on medications like this, I try to do that. Um, But uh, Flomax is one that you take either once or twice a day, and it can help to shrink those tissues. Some people, it helps more than others, though. Then there are other medications that you can either try separately from that that work in a little bit different way to sort of block either. It's really two two ways. One is it sort of shrinks those tissues down from, from one or two different uh, pathways. But a lot of times you have to, to um, add them together. Uh, so some of the other medications you can you can add together to the Flomax. Um, I would just call your physician and say, hey, is there an alternative to this? They may want you to, to see a, a urologist. A lot of people, if you... If you can't really tolerate or you can't take the, like, Flomax, which is probably one of the more popular ones, the uh, common ones to try out first, and it's not really giving getting you relief, then they could add something else to that. Um, 
but some of them will go ahead at that point and, and send you to a urologist. Most of the time, we will check a, a PSA test, too, which I'm sure you've had, um, which is basically just a blood test looking at the prostate-specific antigen. And that can be elevated. Uh, the number can be elevated um, with enlargement of the prostate, but it's typically... Uh, much higher elevations you want to look for for prostate cancer in those situations but uh, I would just have that um, that uh, discussion with them but there's a there's a couple of different things people try over the counter things too like um, saw palmetto uh, it has a weak effect on the prostate in my experience with it um, in, in telling patients about it but um, it can in some individuals if it's just sort of mild uh, symptoms that they're having that can and shrink it down, but I would give it one more chance with a separate medication or added to the Flomax and give it about a month or two to work, and if that's not getting you anywhere, that's the point where I think I would go see a urologist for some some other uh, second opinion on other things you could do. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thank you for calling, Ben. Yeah, that's one that gives a lot of people a lot of problems, uh, a lot of men problems as they get older, and uh, it can be a hassle to deal with, but it does take a long time to see an effect with those medications. And basically, you're either blocking a hormone receptor for that or you're acting in a couple other different ways to uh, really shrink that tissue over time. But it is not, it, you know, a lot of people will just prescribe it and say, okay, let me know if you're having any, if it's not working. And a day later, they call back and say, hey, this isn't working or I stopped it. But it, it, it does take some time to do that, and certainly your physician should be uh, letting you know about that. Uh, what can you do to prevent that? A lot of people ask those questions, too. Hey, my dad has this. There's not really much to, to make a huge impact there. Um, certainly, if you take, we talked about hormones, mainly female hormones earlier. Uh, if you take male hormones, it could actually make it worse because that prostate is stimulated by testosterone uh, or its derivatives. So there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of things to keep in mind if you're if you are being prescribed testosterone. You want to make sure you're doing it uh, that your physician's doing it correctly and that you're not having any potential problems with that. Uh, and that's another reason to sort of look at the prostate. Even if you're younger and not having any problems, if you're on testosterone, that's something that certainly should be looked at sequen- sequentially over time while you're on it because it can put you at risk for things like prostate cancer. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners. So if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies to Relatively Speaking, a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions. Whatever it is, we're here to help. Find out what we're all about and subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB Public Media app.